Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for staying until the very end. So today I'm going to talk about data. How original, right? Well, I'm not going to be talking about technology. I'm not, talk, I'm not going to be talking about computing system and algorithms, and definitely not about big data. I want to instead share with you how, through my professional and personal practice over the years, I've learned that data not only can describe the objective world, but it can especially grasp and illuminate aspects of our lives that we hardly associate with numbers. In my day job, I of course work with data. I am one of the partners and the creative director of Accurate, a consulting firm where we use design methods to help clients in the private and public sectors to innovate on how they work with data and visual analytics. So every day at Accurate, our clients present us with challenges on how to make sense of complex system of information. And every day with my team, we frame and solve them through visual representations. Like, for instance, uh, where we turn vintage posters coming from IBM's brand identity and visual heritage into data visualization guidelines that now helps all of their teams representing data in the different scenarios they are presented with on a daily basis. Or when we collaborated with Google News Labs and turned millions of online, of online conversations and Google searches for the 2016 US presidential elections into these fluid data bubbles that showed how and how much all of the topics of the candidate's political platform were searched online from all over the world. To when we built these abstract cities made of data to illustrate urban health related issues for the World Health Organization. And as you can already see from these previews, our work with data is strongly driven by design that focuses on worm and bespoke approach to the presentation of information. And actually, what I want to show you today is my and our more speculative work. I will share some extreme experimentations that feed back into my business practice and day job, but the most importantly, let me question and explore how we can reconnect data with what it represents, that are always our lives, our stories, and our ideas. To begin with, for a long time now, I've been trying to use data as a medium to create human connections, and not necessarily through technology alone. For instance, in 2017, the organizers of the TED conference came to us before their last edition in Vancouver with a challenging brief. How could you use data from the conference participants to give something valuable back to them? So as a creative agency working with data visualization, we initially imagined to create an installation on a big wall where we could use an algorithm to match participants with similar profiles according to the information that they shared when they registered online, such as their job position, where they're from, and so on. But ultimately, in what way was this, would this data be meaningful? And so we decided to look for data in less obvious places. And we created what we called data portraits of all of the people who were at TED. Images that have been created before their eyes, and so that's uh, me like drawing on my iPad. Images based on people's answers to a series of questions that we translated into a unique hand-drawn data-driven image where every color, symbol, and position of the elements that you're seeing is a direct translation of one person's answers. And these images were immediately then printed on buttons that people would wear throughout their conference on top of their TED badges and use as a tool for sparking conversation and finding commonalities with each other. We asked simple but yet evocative questions, as you, as you can read on the right, uh, such as which TED letter are you, technology, entertainment, or design? Or uh, do you get your best ideas after an adult beverage or while at work? How messy is your desk? Or how many unread emails in your inbox before you freak out? And, and people at TED were wearing their abstract symbols on their badges. And they would use them to identify similarities and differences with other people at the first glance, really like an excuse to introduce themselves, an icebreaker to start a conversation. So in this case, we've been working with soft and definitely small data that have been proved to be more, much more meaningful than anything we could have gathered digitally or automatically, and creating a set of images that uniquely represented the combination of thoughts and ideas of a single person. But we can do even more. So contrary to the belief that data is cold and impersonal, 
I argue that we can instead use data as a lens and a tool to better understand our human nature in a very personal way. And to this point, I'm sharing with you now one of the most revolutionary projects of my life. Uh, it was a personal project, a self-initiated project, a collaboration with Stephanie Pozovic, a London-based designer who shares with me the passion and obsession about data. So we didn't know each other, but we decided to run a very radical experiment, starting a communication using only data, no other language, and we opted for using no technology whatsoever to share our data. In fact, our only means of communication would be through the old-fashioned post office. For what we call Dear Data, every weekend for one year, we used our personal data to get to know each other. So personal data around weekly shared mundane topics from our feelings to the interaction with our partners, from the compliments we received to the sounds of our surroundings. Information that we would then manually hand drawn on a postcard sized sheet of paper that every week would send from London to New York where I live and from New York to London where she lives. Where the front of the card was the data drawing and the back of the card contained the address of the other person, of course, and the legend, how to interpret our drawing. So the very first week of Dear Data, we actually chose a pretty cold and impersonal topic. How many times do we check the time in a week? And here is the front of my card, and you can see that every little symbol represents all of the times that I check the time, position per days and per hours, chronologically. Nothing really complicated here. But you can see in the legend how I added anecdotal details about these moments. In fact, a different type of symbols indicates what was I checking the time? Why was I checking the time? What was I doing? Was I bored? Was I hungry? Was I late? Did I check it on purpose or just casually glanced at the clock? And this is the key part, representing the details of my days and my personality through my data collection, using data as a filter, as a lens to discover and reveal, for example, my never-ending anxiety for being late, even though I'm absolutely always on time. So Stephanie and I spent one year collecting our data manually to force us to focus on the nuances that computer cannot gather, or at least not yet, using data to explore our, also our minds and not only our activities, like in week number three, where we tracked the thank yous that we said and we received. And when I realized that I mostly thank the people that I don't know, I'm apparently a compulsive thinker for two waitresses and waiters, but I definitely don't thank enough the people who are close to me. So over one year, the process of actively noticing and counting these type of actions became a ritual and actually changed ourselves. We became much more in tune with ourselves and aware of our behaviors and our surroundings. Stephanie and I connected at a very deep level through our shared data diary. We really became close friends uh, thanks to our data. Even if she doesn't look so convinced in this picture, I should say, but, but I liked it anyway. But we could do this only because we put ourselves in these numbers, adding the context of our very personal stories to them. It was the only way to make them truly meaningful and representative of, of ourselves. So Dear Data led to many exhibitions and eventually to a book, and that it has found the most exciting home and as the original set of our cards have been acquired by, the, um, um, by part of the permanent collection of, of the Museum of Modern Art. But what excites us even more, what excites me even more, is that it was a personal project that has been so well received. We've seen thousands of postcards made by people who learned about the project and wanted to experiment on themselves. Even teachers of any grades are using this format to teach their students the world of data. In a way, it has opened the idea of data to a wider audience. It has made it more approachable and it made it speak our language. And to further this point on how we can humanize data and make it speak our language, I'm sharing with you one last project this afternoon. It's a collaboration with musician and composer Kaki King, uh, who is also a dear friend of mine. And unfortunately, it's a project that originated from an unlucky moment in her life. When last summer, her three years old daughter, Cooper, was diagnosed with a condition called ITP, an autoimmune disease where her body attacks her platelets, and that leads to spontaneous bruising, also burst blood vessels called petechia all over her body, and in the most terrifying cases, even internal bleeding. 
So when Kaki told me what was happening to Cooper, I wanted to find a way to support, or at least to make clarity and sense in this terrible situation. ITP is a very visual disease, if you think about it. And in this moment of uncertainty, I helped Kaki to, uh, with a structure for how to observe what was happening. And she began to write down daily the level and intensity of Cooper's bruises and petechia, what treatments she had, her platelet numbers. But she also annotated the activities for the day and her own level of fear and hope. And we did so primarily to try to channel, to monitor Cooper's trend and to try to channel anxiety and stress into a semblance of control. But also as part of an ongoing collaboration between Kaki and me, we decided to share this journey, not with words, but through this data. So I've created a data visualization of, of that, but um, not probably exactly the type of medical data visualization you, you, sh you would expect. As I was reading Kaki's record, I was really overwhelmed with feelings. These data are intimate and very intense, and I asked myself, can a data visualization evoke empathy and activate us uh, also at an emotional level and not only at a cognitive one? And can looking at a data visualization make you feel part of a, a story of a human's life? So I started to structure this fluid timeline where each white element, we can call them a petals is a different day for a total of four months of this data collection. And the timeline is structured in sections that are the moments in between the readings, meaning when Cooper was admitted to the hospital to have her blood check, because this moment really pays their days. So every time there's a lab test, we start a new group of petals, and the platelet counts from the lab tests are represented by these red dots at the beginning of each group of days. And I should say that the normal range for a platelet count is 150 to 400. So the numbers of one, seven, and 30 that you see at the beginning are very frightening. And then I began to incorporate Cooper's skin as observed by Kaki. The intensity of the bruises for each day that she observed is represented by these purple and green splotches. The petechia are the small pink dot that you see on each petals, and the larger and the more present, the more they were present on Cooper's skin. And I'm just getting back to the overview for a moment as the visualization builds up. When Cooper, Cooper was taking medications, you will see these gray shapes affecting the days. And here is when Cooper has, has had some incident that caused her skin to worsen, such as she felt at the park or she was uh, bitten by a mosquito. But there's also all that was going on in Kaki's life and in her mind. So Kaki tours a lot and she felt very stressed when away from home in this particular moment of her life and that is indicated with these black dots on the days that she was gone. But in these dark months there have been also positive moments such as a fun birthday party for Cooper or her brother or a great Halloween night that are represented here as these bright yellow spots that cheer up the visual in a way. And lastly, Kaki also kept track of her level of hope and her level of fear for the day on a scale of on one to 10. That I visualized through these floating lines framing the days where the dark lines are the fears and the orange lines are the hope. And all around, we added Kaki's personal notes for each day. And ultimately, this data also became a piece of music that Kaki composed directly from the four, four months of data collection. And this is the score that she used as a base, where the timeline of the song represents what was happening in their lives, exactly as the data visualization that you saw. We premiered this project at a closed conference of healthcare executives in San Francisco where Kaki played the song live. And I'm going to play for you now part of the song. And I invite you to get immersed in this data and see if you can feel something through data.
So as you can probably see, this is not by any means a scientific representation of data. Still, I think it, pretty, it paints a pretty complete and sensorial, and very sensorial picture of this personal journey. After we released the project publicly, we've received hundreds and hundreds of very personal messages from parents, caregivers, healthcare practitioners, and in general human beings that were deeply moved by this story that we only told through data. And we're also beginning to collaborate with various organizations in the field. But I don't want to say that these can lead to any scientific breakthrough in the medical field. That's not the point of my research. But I believe that radical experimentation of this kind, artistic experimentation of this kind, can be a starting point to reconsider how we might approach data in the first place if we want data to speak our language. What I want to leave you with today is what I call data humanism, which is how I'm calling the philosophy that guides my work. So in the Renaissance humanism, European intellectuals put an end to the dark medieval time by placing the human nature, instead of God, at the center of their view of the world. And I believe something similar needs to happen with the universe of data. Now, data are apparently treated like a god, keeper of all of the infallible truths for our present and our future. And the experiences that I shared with you this afternoon taught me that to make data faithfully representative of our human nature, we need to start designing ways to include empathy, imperfection, and human qualities into how we collect, process, interpret, and display them. I do see a place where instead of using data only to become more efficient, we will all use data to become more human. Thank you.